Um, thank you for joining us this morning. This next session of the inaugural U.S. World Heritage Site Managers Forum is focused on philanthropy and U.S. World Heritage. And uh, with that, I'm going to kick it over to the panel and say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing your subject matter expertise. And thank you so much for sharing our passion for leveraging world heritage to protect and promote world heritage in the United States. Well, we'll just start with introductions, I guess. Um, I'm Rosebud Coffey. I'm the executive director of Mission Heritage Partners. Uh, we're the friends group to the San Antonio Mich Missions National Historical Park. I'm Christine Jacobs, um, park partner. Um, I'll go ahead. I'm Shannon Clifford. I'm the executive director of the Mesa Verde Foundation, which is a philanthropic partner to the Mesa Verde National Park. And I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for the invite. Likewise, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm David Niegler. I was, until last month, was the um, board of directors chairman for Mesa Verde Foundation. Got to work with uh, Shannon and our board colleagues, and of course, the folks at the park. And I'm Valerie Kind. I'm proud to be with the National Park Foundation as the official national charitable partner to the Park Service. And I am absolutely thrilled to be here today. My role is Senior Vice President of Individual Giving and Foundation Relations. And I'm excited to be part of this amazing panel. And I'm Stuart Graff. I'm the President and CEO of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, which owns two of the eight properties in the Frank Lloyd Wright Architecture serial um, inscription on the World Heritage List, Taliesin in Wisconsin and Taliesin West in Arizona. And I'm joining you, as you might guess from the backdrop, from Arizona today. <clears throat> My name is uh, Simeon Warren. I work for, at, in the Cultural Resource Directorate uh, at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. And our role in MPS is to develop new ways to pres preserve our cultural heritage um, through, uh, through research. Maybe to kick us off for, for our discussion, um, you know, one of the things that we chatted about as we were preparing for the session was sort of this interesting phenomenon of how being a part of the World Heritage List aids our efforts in philanthropy or at times maybe presents mm -hmm. a little bit of an obstacle. And I'll just kick us off with the latter piece, um, and not to start off on a negative, but it's, I think it's a reality, uh, especially here in Arizona, where saying that we're a part of a UNESCO World Heritage List is something that we are very, very careful about because there is a lot of anti-UNESCO sentiment in our state. Um, for some uh, of our donors being part of a UNESCO World Heritage List, well, for all of our donors, I think being part of the World Heritage List is a real positive. It's, it emphasizes the unique significance that, um, that our two sites and the other six sites um, that are part of our serial inscription, you know, that what we bring culturally, not just to our communities, but how we bring our communities onto the world stage. And that's very, very exciting. But we do have some folks that are very um, hesitant to be a part of UNESCO. It has been in the United States, especially in recent years, a, a controversial organization. And we can be very quiet about UNESCO. In fact, most of our public statements uh, these days just reference the World Heritage List and don't reference UNESCO at all. Uh, I don't know how our other colleagues on the panel um, you know, see that and what your experience is, but maybe you wanna jump in and share. Um, I would agree with Stuart. We had that uh, same issue uh, when we received the designation. Um, we lost actually several donors, several large donors uh, because of UNESCO. Um, unfortunately, and I do think it has to do with, um, well, some of the branding um, and how we relate that and uh, because of potentially the states that we're in. Um, but I, it does have to do with how we brand education, um, et cetera. But that is, it, it's a connotation and know your audience also. I can, I can say that from our perspective, um, the World Heritage Site designation um, existed long before the foundation did. So we haven't actually seen a change, obviously. Um, but I will say that being a World Heritage Site um, tends to be an advantage. Uh, Mesa Verde National Park is not a park that you can swing by on your way home. You, mm -hmm. you visit intentionally. 
Um, and I can say that the majority of the people who come to the park are not coming because it is a park. They're coming for the cultural piece, the historic piece. Um, our park really represents the story of the history of the ancestral Puebloan people and people come intentionally to learn more about that. So I would say that that it's more of an advantage for us. Um, and I haven't seen the disadvantage part, but I wasn't around early enough to see that designation. And I'll jump in to say from the National Park Foundation perspective, um, we are of course looking at donors and prospects through all lenses, multiple lenses mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. And we reach for the things that inspire folks most. And for sure, each park and each site that is part of the World Heritage sites are so special in their ways that we use this in absolutely the right moments to, to really lean in. I'll also say that I think um, this gathering today is really important to say there probably are times that we've not leaned in as much as we could or should. And so when we find those really bright spots um, being so important on a international stage for each of these sites, I think this is a really nice opportunity to continue to um, bring that forward to our donor groups and to let them know that it's not just an amazing site locally, culturally, naturally, but also on the national and international stage. You know, Valerie, I want to just um, pick up on something that you've just said. I think the Frank Lloyd Wright sites um, around the country have tended to be celebrated locally. We've got this unique property, this unique architectural heritage, and to some extent it's celebrated because these sites are also national historic landmarks. It's celebrated as a unique American, uh, uniquely American contribution. That's what Frank Lloyd Wright was out to do, was to create an American architecture as opposed to the imported architectural styles that had dominated um, uh, building, um, particularly uh, building uh, in uh, colonized areas of the country um, for, you know, since the country came into existence. And so he was trying to create something unique. But it is compelling, I think, to our donor base, um, and I think I can speak for all the right sites, to be able to point out that unique contribution to human culture that's represented by the World Heritage List. I think we tend to, uh, we've tended historically to view our role within our American culture and haven't leaned as much into our role in human culture. And it was really wonderful to be able to celebrate uh, back in 2019 when our inscription came through, uh, to use the language from the inscription, um, Wright's pivotal role in the development of modern architecture, which has historically been viewed as something that came over from Europe to America. And it turns out it was the other way around. It's really um, centers in America with the development uh, of, of uh, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and how that then changed the world um, is summarized neatly by being part of the World Heritage List because of that that unique role that he played. David, Simeon, I don't know if there's anything you want to yeah, bring in uh, here. Skewer, that's an interesting comment that you're actually lever leveraging um, not financial, uh, but uh, a humanistic uh, approach to, to the work. And that's an interesting kind of conceptually is interesting um, because you're actually saying that um, this, is, uh, this is the thing that is more important. Um, and sometimes our consideration when we're talking about leverage is talking about funding. Um, and uh, we don't sometimes look at that kind of more humanist approach. And I think that's important. I'd be interested to kind of know from the other sites uh, how, how they feel about that. Hmm. Well, maybe, maybe Simeon, I'll just expand on what you uh, you were just saying. You know, one of the things that we've certainly seen is that, especially you know, over the last couple of years, with all of the human need that's been exposed as a result of the pandemic, one of the things that we've seen is that it's challenging to raise money for needy buildings. Um, there are needy children. There are needy mm -hmm. uh, unsheltered people. I mean, you can go up and down the list. But I often liken the work that we do um, as, as building a hospital, right? There, there are some people, some egomaniacs that really want a big building with their name on. But most of the time when people donate money to a hospital, they donate because they want to cure sick people. They want to end disease. They want to end suffering. And they know that there's a building that's needed in order to do that. Um, when we lever this, this human culture aspect, you know, to celebrate American culture and having the buildings preserved, having 
our education programs funded helps us to celebrate these unique contributions to human culture. That's a much more compelling case than simply saying we need to fix the, the, the water distribution system or we need to put a new roof on. People get the fact that the buildings represent something bigger than the buildings themselves. They represent a cultural contribution. And I think that's true of all the sites. I, I had the pleasure of visiting Mesa Verde um, just this past summer for the first time. And the buildings are amazing. The park is amazing, but the story is what's really remarkable. And this is the tangible material culture representative of the story. And I think and once, Stuart, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Stuart, just, be, just be kind of before we move on, um, I think it was interesting about the last session is how many different kind of uh, organizations and people were uh, in in that conversation doing their own things, but bringing, bringing together this whole kind of collective partnership. And uh, I think it's probably uh, most sites have have that need and ability to bring together those those uh, holistic groups um, to meet multiple needs. Be again interested to know from the mission's point of view and and uh, Messi Verdi's point of view how how their work. Uh, creates those partnerships. Fundraising is a natural by byproduct of a really good, compelling story. Right? Absolutely. I mean, and that's it becomes a part of that story. Exactly. A, a really good story. Fundraising is just a natural byproduct of that. You would hope. I mean, you know, that's absolutely right. And Valerie, I think you were trying to jump in before. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was just going to add on to, to what the group has been saying that, you know, we think about each of these sites as their own iconic, extraordinary places, which they are, and how we then connect to a higher level above that. And I think that's one really beautiful thing about the World Heritage Site list, that it allows us to tell a much broader story um, across the nation, across the globe. And so when you're talking about, you know, what's the really great fundraising story, I think that it, it happens on multiple levels, right? What's happening at the site, what we're protecting, what's happening in the community. There was a really great presentation earlier about um, marketing and getting people to the site. How do you encourage people to come out to the far corners of the world in order to um, experience these things? And if you can keep building in to that next level, you have an even more powerful story. And so I go back to saying the lenses that we talk about each site, it's not one, it's multifaceted. And the more we can find community and partnership in this group and, and others in order to um, elevate that, I think that really becomes special in inspiring donors about their unique role in helping preserve and protect these places. I would agree. And I, I think I would say that one of the most important things that we do at the Mesa Verde Foundation is share the story of the indigenous people. Um, Mesa Verde has 26 affiliated tribes. And sometimes it's just reminding people that, that their story is our story, right? Their story is the story of the United States, the history of, of who we are and, and what we've done and um, how we can be responsible for, for preserving these incredible sites and then giving people ownership of that, right? Offering them the opportunity to support the site that they love so much um, in a way that really helps them to understand that their gift um, or their partnership uh, is preserving this for generations to come, this history of our people. Another topic that we were discussing um, as we were preparing for this roundtable was ways that we use our world heritage status at each of these sites to develop creative partnerships or creative fundraising opportunities. Does anybody in the group have anything that they'd like to, to kick up that, uh, that discussion off with? Well, I actually just got back from a five day in depth behind the scenes tour with a group of 20 donors who all um, paid to participate in the tour. And I can tell you that they didn't come to the tour. In fact, we asked them, why are you here? What brought you here? And they didn't come because we had beautiful landscapes or because we have um, amazing wildlife, which the park does. Um, they came to hear the stories. They came to see the behind the scenes. They wanted to see the collections up close. They wanted to be in the dwellings. They wanted to hear from our guides, one who was an 
uh, who is a historian um, about the National Park Service and specifically about um, Mesa Verde National Park and one who was an indigenous guide. Um, and so we have leveraged their, um, their experience and their knowledge to bring people into our park. And people left saying, how can I help? Um, I wanna sponsor a bear box. What can I do to make sure that I become a member of your foundation? Um, you know, I wanna support the ancestral lands crew and what they're doing here. How can I do that? So telling the story live and in person um, of the people and of the park, I think, um, and connecting that to the fact that, that we are a world heritage site, that our site is beyond just the borders of the park, that it means, you know, a significant, um, it, it means a significant amount to people beyond our borders. We had people who came in from Maine, we had people in from Dallas, um, Arizona, all of those people uh, made a real effort to come and they will leave telling the story of the people. Um, and so I think our job is to tell the story of the people and then kind of explaining why that's important to preserve. So that that those opportunities create larger partnerships and long-term donors, I think. Rosebud, do you want to yeah. jump in here? Yes, I would I would say on our end, <clears throat> as our parks friends group, our you know goal is to preserve, protect, and promote our park. And in addition, similarly to what Shannon is talking about, not only is it attached now to all of our collateral marketing material that goes out to everybody and all of our donors and potential donors, it's just something that is is naturally on everything now, everything that's branded. And, you know, as as I was saying, Stuart, as you and I were saying earlier, UNESCO can UNESCO in front of World Heritage can sometimes have a negative uh, connotation. We really have just kind of just used World Heritage Site, Texas's only work, you know, only World Heritage Site. So that's re really kind of on everything. And you know, we really haven't done a beta test to see if that's a draw, if that's um, increasing donors um, or increasing membership or the give, that would be a good test to see, but it is on all of our branding. But as far as leveraging it in another way, I'd love to hear from other World Heritage Sites here in the United States to see what they're doing with it. Have they used it? How have they used it? to see. David, it looks like some of your technical challenges have been resolved. Um, what's, uh, uh, do you want to jump in here? Yes, uh, sorry, the uh, system was trying to put me in twice, I gather. Uh, and you will be pleased if uh, anybody wants to hear from me once. Uh, we've done a lot in uh, southwestern Colorado with community partners, and they have derived uh, fair amount of revenue from their association with the park. We've got uh, hotels that have poster boards up in their lobbies saying you should go see Mesa Verde National Park. There's a winery that is, has been very supportive. So working with businesses in small towns, it's um, I don't know that the designation itself makes a huge difference, but it does allow us to approach them, give them some, you know, some local bragging rights. I see in the webinar chat a question uh, from A. Miri. Um, do you have any connection with schools, colleges, and universities? So I'm gonna jump in on this and this notion of building partnerships. One of the things that we've done because the two Taliesin campuses were historically used for architectural education through Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentice programs. Um, so one of the things that we've done is to partner with the University of, uh, well, various universities in the HABs program have come to our sites to do award-winning HABs drawings. And I assume everybody here is familiar with HABs, the Historic American Building Survey. But we've also partnered with um, uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania Historic Preservation Program led by Frank Matero, and uh, more recently with the University of Arizona, College of Architecture, um, Planning and Landscape Architecture, and um, work to uh, typically in the form of thesis projects or studio projects, 
where graduate students are using our sites as their work, as their source of study or their focus of study um, to develop everything from interpretive plans, uh, architectural plans, restoration plans, materials testing, which I would think be particularly interesting to Simeon and the work that NCPTT does. Um, uh, we've had, I think now, five master's or PhD thesis projects created. We've also had, um, at this point, I think it's probably over 100 students in the last several years who have come to spend time on our campuses to do this work. And these projects are ongoing. So this has been really great because not only are we getting terrific work led by thought leaders in the field, um, we're getting it typically for pennies on the dollar. Uh, in some cases, we pay for plane tickets and we put the students up on campus. Um, and that's the full extent of our investment. But what we're, we're getting are reports that would cost us if we'd gone to a, a typical preservation consultant would cost of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the World Heritage piece really lends a lot of um, a benefit to that. For the students, they get to put a World Heritage um, uh, site or two onto their resume. And that really helps them with their careers. In some cases, they've gone on to work with leading firms and uh, that we've hired for some of our projects. Uh, but it also gives them this opportunity to look at, um, at uh, sites differently, to think about it in the lens of a much longer time scale than they might otherwise have looked at something, um, because they're thinking about how to preserve this site really as part of world heritage over, uh, you know, as long as I guess, uh, as they're capable of staying there. Um, the, we talk about them with a different time frame, and that's been very, very exciting um, to have those university partnerships. Okay. Valerie, I, Simeon, anything you want to add there? Yeah, if I, I, I'll jump in kind of real quick. Uh, I mean, part of our role in the National Park Service is we we also give out grants, and uh, and part of that process is connecting with the universities um, and sites um, to develop uh, uh, new ways of working uh, with uh, new, new systems, preservation technologies. And I think the exciting thing about that is that we can seed funding to organizations to test out uh, new approaches to work, which they don't have questions to. And again, you know, looking at leverage in universities uh, and the student bodies that they have to do some of that work allows that initial work uh, to happen at, at a much uh, lower cost. Uh, and also it's training a new gen generation of professionals, which is really the most exciting thing. I was on a call yesterday with Tulane University uh, and the Polytechnic in uh, Puerto Rico in San Juan, uh, which obviously is a uh, uh, contained by a World Heritage Site, and it looks like we have a partnership uh, developing there, uh, which will help Chippo uh, and San Juan and and the whole island develop a, a new way to document uh, the the uh, resources within that uh, that uh, the island, but also within San Juan and the World Heritage Site. And as I say, that was just yesterday, but. The ability to bring together multiple universities, multiple professional organizations and sites, I think allows uh, resources to be leveraged in a, a way that allows uh, that money to go a lot further. Uh, and then eventually, potentially, those C funding could lead towards uh, much bigger asks for to do specifics once you've proven conceptually that these uh, these kind of things that we don't quite know, but really need to achieve on sites um, uh, can actually uh, functionally uh, be uh, funded. Uh, and so that's part of our role in MPS and also nationally. And uh, I know a lot of sites uh, I've probably dealt with, uh, the NCPT has probably kind of worked with a lot of sites all over and some people might not even know that. But uh, because that seed money goes to the university sometimes, sometimes to the sites. But um, and again, it's uh, that idea of leverage in the universities and the student bodies and creating those new professionals for the sites is very exciting. 
So I mean, it sounds like you and I should connect on some of these uh, these initiatives. Uh, we've got some overlap there. Rosebud, I saw you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> basically a, a lot of the same that you all are saying um, with five four-year universities here and a number of junior colleges, there is a lot of overlap. Um, we have a number of internship programs um, and uh, we also have an uh, ECOMOS intern every summer along with the city of San Antonio, um, but there are architectural student interns, they're, they're all graduate students, architectural interns, archeology span interns, history interns, they're all graduate students working on their thesis or dissertation, doing work here. Some of them have gone on um, with careers in the National Park Service. We also have a wonderful um, stone, historic stone preservation collaboration with the American Youth Works and Texas uh, Conservation Corps that's been going on for 15 years now. Um, that's a three-way partnership between the Park Service and Mission Heritage Partners and American Youth Works where they train uh, young people from American Youth Works with some of our master stone masons. They do an internship and they learn this craft and then go on, they're 18 to 25 year olds, and then they can go on and take those skills. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. But anyway, just kind of tagging on to what the two of you all said, these wonderful, valuable internships that are provided. Yep. I see Valerie had her hand up, then Shannon, and then we've got a question in the Q&A. So um, why don't we do it in that order, Valerie? Yeah, and just quickly to add on to that. So, you know, I know this is also about philanthropy and where do you get money from? So the National Park Foundation does in fact um, fund uh, many internships and fellowships. We also do it under a lot of different umbrellas. Um, the program that Rosebud was just mentioning, one of them, the Cultural Landscape Apprentice Program, for example, is under our Latino Heritage Fund umbrella. So, or we also have a Women in Park Fellow that's happening right now. We have the Mellon Fellowships that are just, um, really leaning into America 250 and humanities. So there are lots of different ways for different parks and sites to get engaged with this kind of thing. But I also just open it up to um, the rest of the groups that are not part of the National Park Service to say, you know, there really is a huge hunger out there um, for these partnerships, right? Not only with universities, but with other groups, with um, other collaborations. So just to mention the Cultural Landscape Apprentice Program that's happening at San Antonio Missions, that's a partnership between the Latino Heritage Fund of NPF, the San Antonio Missions, Mission Heritage Partners, America Youth Work Conservation Course. This is the power behind it. And when funders see that multiple groups are working together, that ends real credibility. And it is what um, Simon was saying as well, a, a pilot that can become something long running. So that um, apprentice program is in its second year of a cohort. So there really is something to say. And this leads directly into how we get these young people hands-on real experiences in these extraordinary world heritage sites so that they put them on their resumes and they continue down this path of preservation, history, um, and other careers that are opening up to them. Right, and that's, Valerie, I'm sorry, that's a completely different, what you're talking about is completely different than the one that I was talking about with the Masonry Apprentice Program. Yes, if you're, the Latino, yes, Cultural Landscape Apprentice, which we are perpetually grateful for in its very successful second year. So there are lots of collaborations going on. And great models to look at, you know, to, yes. to talk to any one of us to say, how did you mm -hmm. do that? Or what did you do? Can we, can we brainstorm together? Mm -hmm. I think there's some really great models across this, this uh, cohort that we can certainly right. continue to dive into. Absolutely. Shannon? Sure. So I was going to talk a little bit about the colleges and universities, but also um, other opportunities to kind of bring youth um, to support the park. So um, Mesa Verde National Park has uh, partnerships with multiple universities um, and some of their requests actually to the foundation are for support for some of these. So we've provided support for um, conservation legacy interns to come into the park. We're currently working to find funding for graduate students to come and assist with the exhibit design process for the Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum. And then there was a question actually in, in the Q&A box that I wanted to address. The Ancestral Lands Crew that I spoke of earlier is a group of um, descendants 
from the Puebloan people um, who understand the masonry involved in stabilizing some of these dwellings. And we think it's very important for the stabilization work to be done by the descendants of the um, ancestral Puebloans. And so we are working to raise money so that we can bring that crew in to stabilize multiple projects um, in a very natural way. And if you were to ask the, uh, the members of the ancestral lands crew, they would tell you that it's a very important mix um, of sand and water and, and whatever else they are not telling us. Um, but it's important, right, to, to honor their heritage and to make sure that we know um, that what we're doing is the right thing. Um, first, do no harm, right? So we want to bring back the people who know exactly how to stabilize these dwellings. And um, we're happy to be a part of that. We're happy to be a part of bringing in young people um, to continue to support the park, as, as Rosebud said. Um, you know, we're hoping that they will continue to preserve um, our park for, for generations to come. I want to turn to uh, Frank's question because he's been waiting for about 20 minutes for a, a response. So, and then I'll, I'll come back to the other hands that are up. But um, uh, Frank Biazzi writes, most people in the US don't understand the meaning and purpose of UNESCO or World Heritage. Could philanthropic groups and NPS do more to highlight and clarify the human intent, humanistic intent of World Heritage designation and UNESCO's convening role and process for facilitating that or perhaps studying ways of mitigating negative connotations. I guess I would say, Frank, that um, from, from our perspective is I think the, the challenge isn't within our, our group so much as it is in the political sphere. That yeah. you know, for our groups, we're sort of running up against the politics of UNESCO mm -hmm. and not the World Heritage Program UNESCO, which I think there is a great deal of love for, but the mm -hmm. term UNESCO itself and what it means politically in the United States. So I guess I would say that I'm not sure that it's a battle that we need to take on um, mm -hmm. because we can leverage the, the term world heritage without the term UNESCO and uh, and get uh, get what we are um, you know get get what we're needing from that for the purpose of fundraising uh, without running into any obstacles. And then to Valerie's point, knowing your audience, using um, the the UNESCO relationship where that adds value to our fundraising messaging. And Valerie, do you want to jump in and add anything to that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, just to say that when we look at mass marketing, right, you use the stuff that's going to inspire people most. When we look to individual grants or individual donors or individual corporations or foundations, we're really talking into what's going to inspire them most. So it really does take the best of all of these things and craft it into a particular way. So um, I'll, I'll stop there for a second. I'm going to add a separate perspective, which I think is kind of teased underneath there, which is, you know, is there something that that we can look at for other models out there that might be helpful um, when, when we start talking about these World Heritage Sites? So. Um, for, for many, many years, of course, there have been uh, many friends groups for whom are supporting national parks. That has been almost as old as the parks themselves. And these are extraordinary people coming together. Over the last two decades, the National Park Foundation has been leaning into the legislative authority to encourage direct support and to convene and be a catalyst for these groups to come together to have super strategic conversations to find commonality within each other. And so these are, you know, 423 national park units across the country and nearly as many friends groups. And so it's really creating the space for people to come together. Um, and I will say that in my um, handful of years at the Park Foundation, we've really seen um, this, this whole park partner group elevate and increase their own philanthropic capacity through our foundation's technical and financial support, administrative support of getting folks in the room and in the conversation. So there might be a way um, to sort of answer that question a little bit more succinctly to create the kind of friends alliance group or formal or informal network using what um, this as a model to create a space for real conversations around fundraising, networking, affinity groups, toolkits, you name it. So it can become the kind of thing that you all need um, in the moment you need to help answer some of these questions that uh, need a little bit more time and attention. That's great. That would be you know, great. 
one of the other types of um, relationships beyond these educational relationships um, that we've also been able to create, and, and I think here the World Heritage List has been particularly valuable, is with our, our uh, tourism and hospitality industry in both of the communities in which the foundation operates, and I think that's true for the other right sites as well. Mm -hmm. World Heritage, in our experience, really um, is a driver of international visitation. Um, and of course, that's part of the reason that the World Heritage Program was created. So to be able to make Scottsdale, where our, head, where our Taliesin West is based and our headquarters is based, to be able to say that it's the World Heritage City, to be able to leverage this through the Arizona Office of Tourism uh, and, and the Scottsdale Convention and Visitors Bureau Visit Phoenix, all of these things have allowed us to develop new relationships with hospitality partners, so hotels, restaurants, um, to uh, gain funding, um, to market what we do on an international stage, to add visibility in our media outreach. These are incredibly valuable partnerships, many of which translate into dollars, but the in-kind support that we receive as a result of these things is also exceptional. And we shouldn't forget um, those media partnerships and their value. It's easy when you're trying to preserve buildings or build trails or whatever it is to focus on the dollars that you need, but those dollars come about in part because of these media partnerships <coughs> this outreach work. And you can get that work done often uh, through your hospitality and, and uh, tourism partners uh, effectively pro bono or at very reduced cost for participation. And that's a big win for us. Is what I'm hearing here is the multiple levels of partnership, but also the long-term need to maintain uh, that development. So, you know, from a small, small seed, uh, it may take many years. Uh, as I say, the project that uh, I've been working on in Puerto Rico and San Juan recently, it's taken me two and a half years to get to the point where I've been able to bring these universities and the SHPO uh, together. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's, you all probably know how much effort and energy it takes to build those relationships. Uh, and I think it's important to say that, uh, that it's not just a quick uh, thing, but it's multiple years of work. Indeed. Looks like Destry has his hand up. Destry? Yes, uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, I want, if you don't mind my interjecting, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, U.S. ICOMOS has been working for some years now to improve the situation nationally with regard to the attitudes about UNESCO. Um, and we have succeeded thus far um, in the Fiscal 23 Appropriation Act. The Biden administration and we and others have supported uh, funding the rejoining UNESCO, funding the back dues of world heritage um, that has truncated our ability to participate in the World Heritage Program and really for truncated the World Heritage Center's ability to function since the U.S. has normally been paying 25 percent of their budget uh, as our dues. Um, I, I, certainly the attitude of uh, and fear of black helicopters and blue berets isn't uh, leaving us everywhere in the country, um, but I would say the majority now understand that World Heritage Program, while a function uh, of UNESCO is a separate treaty that 194 nations in the world have signed on to, um, including the US. And when we left UNESCO, we did not leave the World Heritage Program and we're still signatory to that convention. So um, while it is true, these, these crazy unfounded fears of uh, takeover uh, are still out there in some places. I think the situation is improving. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's that's really great news, Destry. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to hear that. And you know, I you know, certainly if there's anything we can do with the Arizona congressional delegation, you know, to support that, as you and I have talked about in the past, let me know. Um, Christine, I think you said you wanted to jump in with a question at this point. So um, let's turn it over to you. Great, thank you all so very much. There was a lot of interest and in energy in this particular session um, for the World Heritage Site Managers Forum. So I appreciate you sharing your expertise. It's kind of a wrap up question and uh, Valerie is helping us trend in that direction already. You know, what kind of action items do you see? I'm hearing things like potentially, you know, uh, a cohort of um, 
philanthropic organizations across the United States focused on world heritage. Um, to answer that previous question in the chat too, you know, potentially a cohort um, of messaging, some consistent messaging that's really focused on the world heritage sites themselves, you know, US world heritage, you know, from a social media or, or kind of media standpoint, that's what I've heard so far. Um, but to wrap us up and kind of help us propel into the next 50 years of US world heritage site management, what are some other thoughts you all have as philanthropic subject matter experts that we can, that are tangible, that we could actually have more of kind of a call to action? I have a quick one. So uh, for those of you in the philanthropic community, you may already know all about Giving Tuesday. That is coming up on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. It happens every year. It is an international community of people who come together to give, volunteer, support, thank their folks. So there is already an international movement happening. So if you're looking for a low hanging fruit thing to do, that's super easy. Uh, even just social media with the hashtag giving Tuesday, that is the kind of thing that will connect you to a much larger audience. Um, and then on the other side, of course, we mentioned the Friends Alliance as a potential model, if that makes sense for this kind of group to come together and really to uh, collaborate and coordinate as leaders of these kinds of organizations. And uh, I'll just jump in the... Go ahead. We're all talking at once. Um, I'll just jump in and say, I think you know, the opportunity for the World Heritage Sites to come together um, uh, through coordinated uh, communications and marketing campaigns raises the visibility of all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. we found Frank White Right Group, just as an example, the foundation has the largest social media presence of about 350,000 social media followers and over 100,000 engaged users. That's more than all of the other Frank Wide Right sites combined. But when, when, when we lend that privilege to the other sites, when we start to market what they're doing to show what, what we do together, they see a benefit. And I think all of us working together, mm -hmm. particularly to show this interesting dynamic of natural and cultural sites working together that represent our collective American and global human heritage, I think, is, is a very compelling message. And we'll find that we're not actually competing with each other, that we are actually adding to each other because we know that when someone is giving in a, in a particular space, they enjoy hearing and receiving messages that um, you know, from like-minded institutions, from like-minded organizations that share in that overall work that, that the individual cares about. Um, it rarely results in anybody losing any money um, in their fundraising effort. In fact, it tends to increase giving. And so I think that, you know, we would certainly be very open to that kind of coordinated effort. If there are others interested, please. And I think all of us, uh, as we were prepping for this call, said that. Please let us know if this is something that you're interested in doing, and then we can figure out a follow-up plan. I think that sounds great. And, and with that, um, I uh, wanna thank you again. We're gonna transition to our next session uh, with uh, Chris Polglace, but um, really thank you for making yourselves available. Thank you for sharing your subject matter expertise. Thank you for everything you do to partner with not only the Park Service, um, but with each other. So I appreciate your spirit of collaboration so very much.